Hey everyone, welcome back to the Art to Life podcast. Uh, super excited you're here and um, looking out the windows. It's amazing spring day, finally. I don't think I've worn a t-shirt, <laughs> you know, in months. So uh, feels pretty good uh, to just have a t-shirt on. So it's super hot here. Um, so I've been loving all the questions and, you know, we have this a uh, little utility uh, on our website. If you go to arttolife.com and click on podcasts on the right-hand side, you can see a little bar and it's got a, you click on that little bar, it says, ask Nick a question or leave a comment. And uh, people have been using that and they've been asking some really, really great questions. So I love this uh, feature because it allows for more of a conversation. So there's been so many and so many good ones. I just thought I would uh, take this time and just answer some of these questions. Um, let me just say, and I remind you that these answers that I'm giving, this is just from my experience, obviously, and, and, and we're just figuring this out, you know, and it's helpful to hear other points of views, just like an art critique. There isn't anyone who own, owns the, the correct answers, uh, but the person who has more uh, background, more uh, alternative views, can see things more objectively wins, in my opinion. So I'm hoping that today some of my answers uh, will, will help you in, the, in that regard. But believe me, there's many ways uh, to, to think of art and different directions and different ideas. And this is just from my experience, obviously. So with that said, let's, um, let's dive in. Um, this first question is from Lucy. Hi, Nick. This is Lucy. I listen to your podcast a lot while I'm painting uh, at my easel, and I appreciate uh, every single one of them. My question is, you talk about uh, trusting um, yourself and trusting your, your process, and that really leads to some really amazing artwork. Um, sometimes it's not easy for artists to trust themselves um, and trust their process. So, could you give maybe some tips on how to build our trust in our own process? I'd appreciate that. Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Lucy, and I think something we struggle with, and I used to struggle a lot with this. Um, I, I have grown to trust my intuition, which is what really what we're talking about, um, the hunches that we have uh, in, our, in our art making. And I think in many ways, Art making is this practice that we get to do, unlike the rest of our life where uh, you get to make decisions that aren't necessarily practical or that you don't know the reason for making those uh, choices, that they just feel like the right one. And so much of the time, and I, I would say 60% of the time or 70% of the time, I'm following uh, those choices that are more intuitive, that just feel like the right one. Like we can't do this, you know, with bus schedules or, you know, wander into an airport and hope you catch a plane. Most of the time we're trained in this world that, you know, there's a schedule to things and that we need certainty and we need to know what's going to happen if we do make this decision. But not knowing and learning to trust this, and we're not, it's not trust this, it's trust your own spider sense of what you might think is the right, um, is the right answer. This could be choosing a color. It might be uh, changing a mode of working when you're making a painting, you know, being more loose or losing control or... So this is something that, um, that you can develop. And no one ever talks about this. You can improve the muscles of intuition, of decision-making, of trusting yourself. Because certainly, in, you know, in my experience, some of the best work, some of the breakthroughs, almost all the breakthroughs occur when I am just letting go of the steering wheel a little bit. This is when your soul, and this is my theory, that within you is, is some operating instructions. Your, your intuition is the voice of your soul. And 
what needs to come out is often overridden by what other people think, uh, that I didn't go to school or I have to impress people or whatever the baggage is, whatever the limiting beliefs are that can block us, that that can quiet that, the inner voice. Like, you know how people say, well, if you're not sure what to do, you just go for a walk and just go by yourself and lean into this, feel into this. What you're trying to do is quiet down all those other voices so you can hear the one inside of yourself. And when you can hear that, that is, that clarity comes through and it's always there. It's just, we're not listening to it. So you get to improve it hearing this and, and it's a skill, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a practice. And I define art making as the practice of becoming yourself and how better to become yourself than, than, than to, uh, be listening more clearly to yourself. So it's sitting there right now. I, I think sometimes that the art you're gonna be making, your soul already knows. It just needs you to get out of the way, you know? And, and so take small steps is how you do it. Trust a little bit, let go entirely of control just for a moment and see what happens. I promise you, you'll be engaged, you'll be more interested when we become bored by routine, this is when um, this is when the work starts to stall out. The opposite of boredom and routine is risk taking. And risk, it feels risky. It feels vulnerable when we don't have guardrails, when we just let go a little bit. But it is what we're being taught by our art. It's the practice. It's the practice of becoming more and more authentic. And trusting this process is the divine gift of, of creativity, of art making, that we as makers get to do this. Um, so anyway, I love your question and it's probably an entire episode, but thanks so much, Lucy, uh, for chiming in. Okay, uh, so that was really great. And um, there's a lot, lot to that. So, and again, you guys, Feel free to, um, you know, leave a comment, uh, ask a question, follow up question. We're going to be diving into these questions on this podcast in a regular way. So um, I appreciate the conversation. So here's um, a second question that's pretty great. Hello, Nicholas and Noah. This is Andre from Toronto, Canada calling. First of all, thank you so much for part one of your interview. I found it incredibly inspiring. Thank you. My question for you both actually is, what, what is your approach to a work that wants to go in another direction from the one that you had initially conceived for it? That is, imagine if you imagine uh, conceived of a piece as a monochrome, but in the course of making it, the piece was just screaming out to be colored, <laughs> colorful. Um, if, if you're making a piece in one medium, but in the middle of making it, it, it called out for, for other mediums as well. How do you approach those sort of uh, situations? Uh, Andres, uh, great question. And unfortunately, uh, Noah's not here. He's speaking about the episode we just had with my friend Noah. Um, but we probably fall in the same category, so I'll do my best to answer it. And it, and it relates to the question that Lucy just asked. Um, this is the beautiful thing about, about art making is that and, and, and actually, one of my huge interests, uh, a way of being, and, and really was the foundation of this podcast, was the idea of find your way as you go. <laughs> I've always preferred this kind, of, this kind of being because I'm not particularly good at anything, but I can start something and then pay attention and, and listen and take the cues and follow something. And that always is interesting. It might not be predictable, but it's interesting and, and I can learn. And I love that, um, that idea. If I'm working on something and I have a strong impulse to do something else with it, I, I let that, I, I follow that. I, you know, it's really about listening 
I try not to judge it too much because most of the time my intellect isn't at the same level as my intuition. Intuition in art making is the superpower. Intuition is the thing in art making that makes it different than all the other activities we do. And it's really what we're leveraging. You know, just, I don't know why. And I love that you don't need to know why. This is so important. And one of the challenges people have when they're trying to write a bio or an artist statement, they're trying to bring this, you know, you, you read those statements and there's all these, you know, vocabulary words you would never use. And I can barely understand some of the artist statements that I tried to write to sound like I know what I'm doing. But the thing is, you don't really know. And all you really need to do is say, I'm doing this and it just, it just feels right. <laughs> you know, it just feels like uh, a worthwhile thing. It seemed like a great idea at the time. And here I am. What other justification do you need? The art can speak for itself. You know, you don't need a lot of rationale to make something. Um, just curiosity and wonder and that it feels right. So I tend to put a high premium on hunches. Um, and I've learned this through playing and experimenting. I've seen the work that is made this way. I've seen the response to the work that's made this way, even in the most practical sense, uh, the business sense that if you want to sell a lot of art, pay attention to this idea because this is what sells art. This is what makes art that connects to people. Planning out the perfect thing, at least for me, hasn't worked so well. It's never quite that exciting. Your audience, those people who look at your work, when you were on the edge of your seat just a little bit, it puts them on the edge of their seat. And that's what art is about. It's about the wonder and the possibility and that, you know, you're barely hanging on and, and you make a thing despite that, you know, imper imperfections and all. So give it a whirl. Try this, you guys. Follow. Try making a thing. Following your intuition. Watch where you end up. I promise you it won't be boring and it'll probably be related to what you're making. But often that kind of work feels bigger. It feels more expansive. It feels like the grown-up version, the, the more evolved version, the version of you that you're becoming uh, than, than who you are right now. And that is what it's all about. So we have another great question uh, from Justin. Hey, Nick, this is Justin in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon. My question is about materials. I'm working in acrylics, and I feel constantly frustrated by... The paint itself, I'm using, you know, really good paint, really so-so paint, trying different brands, and I'm frustrated with coverage. I can't get good opacity. I can't get good thickness and texture consistently. I don't know a lot about mediums. I need to educate myself there. And also, I'm, I enjoy mixed media. I like to use the oil sticks that I see you using. They're awesome, but acrylic and oil stick do not play well together. I don't know how to varnish or seal that. I don't know how to work with those in a way that might be successful. I'm not ready to make a jump into oil painting. So um, just a low-level frustration with materials all the time that I'm trying to figure out. Any guidance you can offer would be awesome. Thank you so much. So who can relate to this, Justin? Uh, I used to just, I would chase every shiny material object I could early on. I always thought that, well, if I'm this, this new material would be the answer for me and that my art would take off if I learned watercolor, or if I learned encaustic. And so it took me so long to figure out that it wasn't really about the materials. But the, the good news is that I, I got to play with a lot of materials. I learned a lot about materials. I'm pretty much versed in all of them, you know, and there's so many questions I can so relate. So Let's dive into just this thing of acrylic and oil and oil pastels and everything. I like simplicity. And here's, you know, and you know this, I think you mentioned it, that they don't play well together. Acrylic doesn't stick to things that are shiny or oily. So that's just a good way to remember that you can't put, acrylic won't stick to those things. So what's oily, you know, if you had, 
um, oil pastel on as as on a surface, and you tried to put acrylic on it, it it might stick there for a second, but it it doesn't. It will slip off. It'll scrape off. So it's just it, you can't really do that very well. Um, if you think of like the front of a Porsche and it's just this super slick, shiny surface, you know, acrylic will wipe off of that. There's nothing for the acrylic to grab a hold of. Now acrylic, if you put it on cardboard, oh my God, it loves it. It'll never come off of that because it can get into all those grooves and can soak in. So that's all you need to know about the acrylic oil thing. Now I use crayons a lot and I use them on top of acrylic paintings and you know, when you rub a, a, a crayon across the surface, it doesn't, it doesn't like pave it in with crayon. There's little specks of that wax stuff, but there's also specks of porous um, a board left that the acrylic can stick to. So you can kind of get away with it. Um, it'll kind of stick on top of crayon if there's some areas that are absorbent um, or other areas of acrylic, because acrylic sticks to acrylic just fine. So that's... That's what you, how you can kind of get away with that. But boy, you know, using one of those oil pastels, that's not going to work. I mean, you're not going to get acrylic to stick on that. Now, there might be some cool things of the acrylic coming off of that. You know, that thing that kids do where they take black, they put, what is it? They put like colors down, they put wax crayon on top of it, wax resist, and then they wipe it off and the color comes off. That, you know, so you can play around with that. You might want the quality of acrylic peeling away, which is kind of beautiful. So don't, just because it doesn't work per se, it's not as archival, um, it doesn't mean you can't do it because you might want that effect. Okay, so so that's that's sort of how that plays out. Now, in terms of the surface, I'm a little curious because uh, you said you're using good quality paint. That would be my first recommendation for getting a good surface. Acrylic is really crappy, in my opinion, when it's thin. When you just put one coat down, it does. It really doesn't get going. It, acrylic looks amazing when other colors, when you're looking at layers of it, um, you're looking at layers of it and there's some depth. So what I would recommend, Justin, is taking using your acrylic and trying to use it pretty thick. Don't use it like watercolor, use it pretty thick. And building up layers so you've got some body there. One thing I like to do is if you put down a thick layer and you could you try using a trowel, like trowel it on, you know, so you can smooth it on like pancake batter, you know, and it's gorgeous. I mean, you should be able to do squeeze some out of the tube and just, you know, take a brayer and roll across it that will make a beautiful thick mark, uh, really, because it sounds like you're using good quality paint. But something I do is I will put a ground down of like thick white paint, and there's this point where the paint dries, almost dry, and, and it, but it, it doesn't come off, it doesn't come off on your fingers, but it's still damp, and you can feel it, it'll feel cool. And then what you can do then is you can paint on top of that another thick layer of another color or shapes or whatever. And because there's moisture on the uh, coming out of the first layer, the when you put the paint on top of that layer, the acrylic, it won't the the layer underneath won't dry. And so and then it's and then you can do this repeatedly and you can get like it becomes almost like clay you know, and you can scrape into it and carve into it. Most people take acrylic paint and they don't do anything with it. They let the first layer dry and it gets really hard and then they put another layer on and then they dry it and put another layer on. But what I'm suggesting is a cool thing is to put layers down that are kind of damp and the lowest level, the base layer won't dry. So it stays kind of unstable and allows you to scrape with a pen or sand it. It's soft. It's it's a different feeling altogether, and that can create some beautiful, rich uh, surfaces and textures. It's gorgeous. I'm working on a presentation right now for the Creative Visionary Program, and I'll, we're, we're in Texture Week, uh, funnily enough, and I'll be demonstrating this in, our, in the program. But I think you can understand what I'm saying is we're retarding the drying of the acrylic 
by covering that first layer. And once you get it where you want it, if you wait a day, the whole thing will be dry. So that's a cool way to play around with that. So good luck with that, Justin. Okay. Um, all right, let's dive. Here's a question from Tanya. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for everything that you do. I really enjoy all of your videos and all of your podcasts so much and all of the great information that you're sharing with us. I have a question about cold wax and oil. I just started working with it and I really love it. I work on board, but I also have a lot of canvases that I want to work on. And I was wondering if it's okay to use cold wax on canvas. I kind of searched around and I saw someone say that they did not recommend it because it could crack because of the flex of the canvas. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so great question, Tanya. So I use cold wax. Now, it depends on how you're using cold wax, I guess. How I use cold wax is I mix cold wax in with my oil paint. And it extends it, it, it makes it kind of more buttery, and you can make really su smooth surfaces. But I have pretty thick areas of, of this in my work. And I used to just paint on panels, but now I paint on canvas wrapped around a panel. And then once it dries, I peel that off and I roll it up and I have it restretched um, before it goes to the gallery. So always a good, a good thing to do is, and it's thick paint that you gotta worry about. I've had a, a little, few problems with some cracking or peeling um, when the paint's gotten really thick on the edges, but um, providing I've got medium in that and I let it dry, uh, I haven't really had a problem. I mean, think of wax, it's fairly flexible. Now, so you can roll it. And when I say roll it, I'm talking about take the canvas off, like you're not gonna have a problem just taking it off the, the stretcher bars to roll it up. But the size, the diameter of the roll is kind of important. So I would say at least a five or six inch um, roll. You could put this in a mailing tube if you're gonna ship it to a gallery. So if the roll is kind of big, um, it's bending the canvas less. Does that make sense? If the roll was, if you did it on like a saran wrap roll, it'd be really tight. So providing the roll is, you know, six inches, five inches, that's not very stressful on, on the work. Um, so you can try this, just take one of those small paintings and play around with it and see if you can make it crack. Um, but I think if you are just rolling it now, um, I roll it, um, how to describe this? I roll it to where the front of the painting is wrapped around the back of the painting, right? So I'm, I'm curving the surface of the painting outwardly. It's on the outside of the roll. I don't do it the opposite because I feel like that's more like how the painting is going to be exhibited. Um, so... I would try it, but I, I think you're probably okay. Um, it's probably going to be fine. So, but give that a try. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Carney. Nicholas, hi. This, this might seem a little broad, maybe a lot broad, but um, I've been pondering this lately, and I'm really the more I learn, the more confused I am about what the answer is. And that is, what is art? Ah, okay, so <laughs> a little question, uh, short question, big, big uh, answer here, um, or tons to think about. I used to get so hung up about this, and mostly because I didn't think I was an artist. I didn't know if what I was making was valid or worthy or all the everything. But here's how it falls down for me. Art, and I talked about this earlier, art is what you make in the process of becoming yourself. Who cares? You know, like, what's the point of being here? The point here to be here is to become the most authentic version of yourself, to, to explore all that you've been given, this opportunity to feel everything and share everything and take risks and grow. You just have this opportunity to grow on this short, brief time we have here to share things, to, to share what you're doing and inspire other people and to participate. The artifact of that process, in my humble opinion, is art. Uh, 
I don't categorize. I just, art making is the exception to me. Art making is the th one thing that rules don't apply, that anybody can participate in it. Um, I never really fit in and art is the perfect place for me to be. It connects me with other people like you. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's an exceptional, it's the exception. Art is the exception. And, and it's, and it's the, it's the, it's the artifact, the visual evidence, the artifact of you growing and changing and evolving. And that's how I think about it. And what I love about that is that it means everyone's invited. It's super inclusive and it, it precludes judgment because if that's what we're doing, who's to say that anybody else uh, shouldn't be doing this? It's none of my business whether someone wants to make giant rabbits out of M&Ms or whatever, you know, it's like this, everyone's different. It celebrates the uniqueness of all of us and everyone's different and everyone gets to answer what they want to become, what they're going to share, what they're going to learn in this life themselves. And all we have to do is just cheerlead other people because it takes courage to do this. It takes some vulnerability to, to step forward and, and get in the driver's seat of your life. So that's kind of how I think about it. And um, I think it's comforting and, and it's inclusive. And it's what really keeps me in this. It's it's the community of support that that we're that we're doing this together. We're on this creative path together, and we're all doing something different. It's kind of a kind of amazing. What area in the world in your life can you say that about? I hope that was helpful. Okay, so you guys, uh, next question. Um, I believe all the way from India, uh, Shabana. Hi, Nick. This is Shivana from India. I have a question. Like, is it a necessary thing to know the realistic art and uh, the figurative art before doing abstraction? Uh, like, I love doing art, but my realistic art is not so good. But I'm doing good in abstraction. So please guide me. Is it necessary to know the realistic art to enter in the abstraction? Uh, I get this question a lot, and we have we we talk about this in the Creative Visionary Program, um, and I and I love that Shabana, you feel that you know there's permission that there's I can just feel that you are into what you're doing, and and you're just your foot's caught in the door a little bit because you keep thinking, well, I really can't do this unless I do this other thing. And I just want to, you know, I just hope you hear, hear this because you do not have to do anything ahead of anything to do something that brings you alive. And I just want you to go full speed ahead with what you're doing. It sounds like you're kind of into it and excited. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Now, is it kind of cool if you're if you're interested to learn to paint learn to draw something realistically or to learn to draw the figure um yeah it's it's kind of, it's it's a great thing if you're interested if you we could be talking about learning italian right now and it's like oh my god it's amazing it's a whole world you learn italian and then the culture and but if you're not interested you don't need that in order to speak spanish right so you get to choose, but I would choose carefully with what lights you up. You want to choose based on the energy that something gives you. Art is hard enough, but if you start veering into, into areas where you should do something instead of what you feel is the thing you should be doing, um, you can easily stall out. And, and I don't want that to happen for you, you know? Um, so again, there's no rules in art making. This really applies to this, that... People think that they can't make art because they can't draw realistically. That's just drawing is just a thing you can learn. Just Google YouTube. There's a ton of free content. Anybody can learn to coordinate their hand and their eye to draw realistically. It's just, it's a skill, just like riding a bicycle. Um, but the, the better, the sort of more, the deeper 
question is, is what lights you up. Stay in that, do that. And maybe at some point you'll be interested in something else and you'll want to do photography or you'll want to return, you want to learn how to do um, more realistic work, but you do not need uh, to learn that in order to do what you're doing now. Now, does design, studying of design, some of the things we teach in the Creative Visionary Program, design and value, the principles of art making, yeah, you, you need to learn those, absolutely. I, I think you, you wanna be able to understand what you're making and why it's working and why it's not working, how to get unstuck, yes. But there, you're talking about a genre of art that you need to do to graduate into abstract, you don't. Um, so I hope, I hope that was liberating for you and I'm excited. I'm excited for you. I could hear in your voice uh, that you're into it. Okay, we have another question here coming up from Cynthia. Hi, Nick. I was just listening to what you had to say about big paintings that don't work. And I think the thing of it is, because I've thought about this a lot as well, is that a big painting is like a sculpture. It's, it's, it's at human scale or above. And if something doesn't work as a sculpture with our physical body knows it and it just becomes a big nothing, right? I mean, we've all seen sculpture like that. It's big, it's, it does what it does, but somehow it's not there, right? It's just not there. And the same thing happens with painting. So I feel like my whole body is responding to larger paintings. It's not just um, looking at it for a visual kick. It's it's something else. It's something else. And the body knows when it's not working. So I just wanted to share that with you. I enjoy your answering these questions very much. These are the kind of things my students want to know all the time. And we never have enough time to talk about it all. So I'm sending them over to you. Well, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head with this scale thing. Um, boy, you do a large painting and if it's not working... It's sickening, and it, it it's, it's not hard to, to notice, you know. Um, but I think there's something uh, about making something that's as big as you that, like, we go through doors that are a little bit bigger than us. These pictures, when they're as big as ours, become like a world, become like a window. We get to go into them. So I think that's part of it also, that... The invitation to, to go into the work is stronger at scale. We could actually fit in there, you know? Um, and so that has, a, has repercussions for the viewer. Uh, it's, it's powerful and, and it's, um, it creates wonder, you know? So, but I, I, I think you're just right on with, you know, doing something large. And, and that's, why I, why, that's why I don't really recommend if you're learning to make art, I, I wouldn't go large because it's so frustrating and it takes so long to change something and it takes a lot of paint or a lot of anything large and to you can figure out at a smaller scale more quickly um, solutions. It's almost uh, like doing a thumbnail sketch. We can tell pretty quickly if it's working or not when it's just on a, the size of your thumb, but as it gets bigger, it becomes a little bit more challenging to see it. Uh, so there's hard things and wonderful things, but to do a great large painting is um, pretty much the, as good as it gets. And, and uh, so really, I appreciate that question. Okay, here's a question from Sarah. Sarah, Portland, Oregon, and I'm currently taking your CVP course. It's amazing. So thank you very much. I'm learning so much. But I have a question about galleries. I received an email this past week about collaborating with a art gallery in Madrid, Spain, and um, they're upfront about any costs and upfront about the percentage of the sale they would receive. Um, they wanted to showcase my art in September and then um, at an art fair. And then my art would be in their gallery for 15 days. And then it would be also shown on Artsy. How do I go about making sure that I'm doing this in the right way, that my art is safe, that I know that I'm dealing with a legitimate and trustworthy art gallery? I'm a new artist. Anyway, thank you for all that you're doing. Wow, it's tricky, right? And Sarah, such a good question. And I, I hope this is helpful for others. Um, Okay, a, cu a couple things, and it's so simple, actually. 
the way to check some, a relationship out, especially this art one where you have the gallerist or, um, is you, you look on the website and, and they list all these artists and you call those artists, you talk to the people, you talk to the people like you who are in relationship with them. That is the single most powerful way. Do they pay? What's been your experience? Is it great? Does this, you just double check. And artists, as you know, we're like awesome to each other, you know? So that's really, a. I mean, definitely do that. Call a couple of them up. They'll respond, right? Now, the next thing is it's trickier when it's overseas and it sounds like are all the, you know, what's the skin in the game they have? Like, are they saying to you, send us your work, we'll try and sell it, and we'll even put it in our gallery for 15 days, and if it doesn't work out, you, how do you get it back and all of that? The, the flag for me is the 15-day part. You're not, it's not helpful to do a bunch of energy and send a bunch of things away and they show their, your, your work for two weeks. I mean, I have paintings that sit in a gallery for a year and a half before they sell. I mean, two weeks, it, it just, that's like, that's not a commitment. That's not like, oh, we love your work and we want to work with you forever or let's give it a go for a year. Like that's, that's a little like the 15 week thing. It sounds seductive. Like, they're going to put me in the gallery. They're going to do this show, you know, but you probably could spend, you know, like look for a relationship that wants, that wants to meet you where you are and, and we'll put something in, into it a little longer, a little longer term. Um, that's how I, I would say it. So checking with the other artists and then add up, you know, what are they putting into it and what you're putting into it. And if it's not equal um, or it's way off, uh, you have a, have a slight problem. Um, and and I'd, be, I'd be leery of it because here's what's actually at risk. And a, my good friend Carrie had a really hard experience uh, once with this where you send all your work and it's a ton of, a ton of work. And, and then it's a lot to send it. If it doesn't work and you don't get it back, and it's a, and it's it's a dead end and you get kind of burned that above more than anything else could stop you could stop all the future work it's humiliating you feel you've been taken advantage of it creates cynicism and and that's what's at risk move cautiously with this rare thing you make with this you know it's like you, you want to, the things you make, and I'm not saying, you know, overly price it or don't take risks with it, you know, but be mindful of, of, of the fragility of your energy and, and your goodwill. Be, you know, if you're going to choose a place to put it, really try to find the best place to put it. Put a little extra care. Your job is to make the work, but you're also, it's important it's your responsibility to have it end up in places that that are at the level it's at or shows promise or are at the best possible place you can be. You know, if you can only stick it in coffee shops, do some research in town and okay, a coffee shop's not a very big step, but choose the best coffee shop. You know what I mean? Treat your art, it's you. So you you want to be mindful of that. It's about respecting and valuing yourself first and foremost. Believe me, they need you more than, than you need them. And another thing that sometimes you see with these kinds of pitches, and I'm not saying this is that, but you ask around or post on some forums, they might be doing kind of like a cattle call where... Think about it. You, they get 50 people sending their art for free to a thing and they include it and they just got tons of product for free. And all they're looking to do is sell some. They don't care whether it's you or someone else. You want someone who connects with what you're making truly and, and believes in it and is excited by it, by what you're making. 
Um, so anyway, I hope that was helpful. And congratulations, by the way, because even if you say no, and what this means is your work is getting um, seductive. It's getting juicier and people on the outside are wanting this and that isn't going away. Even if this isn't the most amazing deal, these people are, are seeing that this work has possibility. And um, this is not uncommon, by the way, people halfway through CVP, um, you know, start selling their work or noticing others getting more excited because what you're doing in the Creative Visionary Program is you're, you're getting the work stronger. You're optimizing it. As you know, we've gone over this a lot and how you do that. And, and this is, there will be many more opportunities coming because of the results of the, of the investment you're making in your work in CBP. There's more, more and more coming. So if you don't take this one, believe me, there's a more coming. It's not your last chance. <laughs> so I hope, I hope that helps. Okay. Wow. It's amazing how quickly all this uh, time go. This is Nikki, full-time artist and uh, getting dragged down at the, this, this moment in time by all the VAT tax uh, accounts, all of that stuff, which I'm not very good at. So I listen to your podcasts and that keeps me a bit more cheerful and uh, inspired on the odd occasions that I get a chance to paint. Yeah, so I know that there's not a, a real obvious question in there, but I sense the question. The question is how. How sometimes when we are encumbered by all the things that are not our specialty or that don't feel like what we'd rather be doing, how do we stop that? How do we how do we minimize those things? And and I struggle with this a lot, and, and I really, I'm interested in this a lot, this, of, of how you do it all, you know, and how I, and, and Art to Life is my answer to that, and, and what I'm teaching in Art to Life, and how you take the principles of art making, and you use them in the principles of life making. You learn to make your life a work of art, and yes, there's things like taxes, and there's, you know, stuff that doesn't feel like our art. But what I find that is is helpful is, is to kind of approach these things more like art, more like creativity, more like instead of thinking to yourself that, you know, you can't do this, that you're not good at this, that, that you're the only this kind of person, that's just not true. Like we all have the capacity to, to focus on things. When you make art, you completely drop into it. You're so focused on it. And so, you know, how can you do, uh, you know, this, these taxes, your laundry, whatever the things are, these mundane tasks, in a way that connects you back to your art? Now, it seems crazy and pretty far distance, but for example, um, you know, I create spreadsheets for certain bookkeeping things, and, and that's a creative process, how you arrange it, how you dial it in. How can, I, how can I arrange my financial scene so it's easy to understand, so it, it's, I can keep it going with a little bit of effort, but it makes sense to me and it's clear? Um, you know, how can I do laundry? You know, like I have, a, you know, talking on the phone to a friend while you do laundry, it's like, it's perfect. Like that's a great opportunity to take something that's kind of mundane. And it's this amazing time when you connect with people. So suddenly laundry becomes a time of inspiration or, or a time of connection. And so the reason this is so important is that we want to keep ourselves more connected to our art and our ability to drop into it, right? Like, cause you were just saying, you know, like, and then if I have time to paint, do you see how you're thinking about it as a separate thing that sometimes you just don't even have time to get to it and I'll put it off for another day, but it's easier to drop into it when your whole approach is that of an artist, your whole life is that of an artist. How can you cook a meal in a way that relates to your art making? What colors do you love? 
What kind of music do you love? Like you can add music that inspires you to anything you're doing. Maybe you take the day when you do your taxes and you go to the park in your laptop and you do it as like a retreat. You know, you get to creatively problem solve your life, just like you get to creatively problem solve your art. It's no different. And this makes, uh, really starts changing the outcomes. It puts you back in the driver's seat. It makes your art stronger because you're more connected to it all the time. You're no longer feeling like you're not making your art because you're kind of making it all the time. You're kind of in a creative mode. It's the thinking, it's the come from that we love, not so much necessarily the thing we're making, but it's how we feel when we're creating. And we can feel the same way in almost any area of our life. So anyway, I hope I hope that's helpful. I know that's kind of hard to do uh, at times, but even a little bit can make those challenging times because we want to keep you buoyant, right? We want to you want to feel like you're you're just you're just an artist, you know, like well, how we get to be, how we get to be, we get to be creative all the time. Do you know who so so few people get to tap into this? Um, anyway, okay, well, listen, you guys, um, we're coming up on uh, the end here. Um, so thanks for all these great questions. Keep them coming. It's so good. If you have any follow-ups, um, feel free to just uh, go to the Art Life podcast, uh, artslife.com and click on podcasts. And you can click on that little yellow bar on the right. And uh, let me know what you're thinking. Let me know some questions. And I would love it, love it, especially if, if you guys could leave a review or if you, you know, of this podcast, that's sort of turns out that's what they, they send it to more people. Like it exposes this podcast to more people and that's starting to happen. And I, I couldn't be happier because it's, it's us, it's our community. And I just love um, being a part of it and reaching more and more people. I just, it's, it's such a, such a thrill to hear someone in India asking a question that I could never, I uh, would never get to meet, but we get to do it here. So you guys, thanks so much for being here. And I can't wait to talk to you next week. Thanks so much, you guys. Okay, bye.